Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, as you know, um, British Columbia has restarted school uh, in a very limited capacity, com- in a very limited fashion, and um, there's a lot of parameters around it. They're trying to figure out what is going to be safe and what is going to actually work in the long run so that we can teach our kids and... Um, Keep keep our society safe. Um, I, I it it has been recorded that or tracked it that that, um, that the immune system of the our young people is in a way that there we're not showing a lot of infection um, in in our children under, under the age of nineteen. There hasn't been a lot of infection. There's been a few, but at the same time, there's a lot that we don't know that is actually happening. Maybe their symptoms are showing in different ways than they do in adults. Or maybe they are able to carry it. And we want to make sure that all of our society is safe from COVID-19. So, um, Rob Fleming ha- has worked very closely with um, with people like um, Dr. Bonnie Henry in opening the schools in a fashion that will keep everybody safe. There are, are things, parameters in place, lots of hand washing, and things to keep our children safe, to keep our, our elderly safe, and to ensure that all of us do not overwhelm our healthcare system with COVID-19. So, I had a conversation with a really good friend of mine, and she also ran, ran in a federal election um, in Surrey, B.C., and I had a conversation with her because she's also a teacher in a high school of around what is going on with the school systems and a lot of it it's like boots on the ground kind of kind of point of view of what is actually going on with um, this BC school systems and more directly uh, probably in the the Surrey school district Surrey BC so um, there's a couple of things I want to highlight that she was saying um, the online learning is not definitely not a favorite by our teenagers. They want the, the, the social interactions and things. And it and she's point will point out that there's a lot of unknowns. So why don't we get get on get on with that and listen to my conversation I had with um, uh, Annie O'Hanna and with her perspective as a teacher who actually reports in every day to the school and really has dedicated her life to um, helping students learn. So here we go. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely experimental. Absolutely. And I don't, I don't actually think the government would deny that. But from a teacher's perspective, um, 100% what we're seeing is a, is a very, very um, experimental kind of, uh, you know, jaunt in terms of what's going on. Um, it, it's rather alarming, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, it really is. Uh, mm-hmm. Because y- we're used to having a setup of, you know, a sub- you know, of a year. And even as teachers got back from spring break, and I know it's different for different provinces, because, Quebe- you know, Ontario and Quebec have different... Um, yeah. schedules, right? But for us, we came back from spring break, and and we had two weeks to kind of redesign everything, and, and that was amazing because some school, some areas didn't do that, right? They mm-hmm. just barreled forward. So in Surrey and, and in other areas, Burnaby, and U.S., etc., there was an attempt to get devices out, set up food uh, for for low income families. Like like there was um, a very strong effort. 
Um, not a lot of people can really criticize it all that much. It, it really was even maybe even more than we thought would have been done, right? Right. And but but then when it came to curriculum, um, when it came to actual implementation of the online learning, mm-hmm. um, that's where things started to fall apart. Like here's Microsoft Teams, you know, you do your thing, and and so that was a lot of effort. A lot, a lot of teachers will tell you that we found ourselves overwhelmed. Uh, it's a lot more work than being in the classroom. And then we have to reopen. And it's June. This is a very important point. It is June. So mm-hmm. it's high school like me. Like our last day is the 19th or, or 18th, whatever that Friday is. Like it's, right. safe. Like it's it, and that would be assessment time for the most part. It's catch-up time. It's final projects, kind of, you know, like preparing for either an exam or a project. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you have a lot of things like because of the uh, because of the lockdown, we also have to consider the reality of um, like articulation. The grade seven is going into grade eight, and there were a lot of small things, or sorry, big things that usually happen that could not. So it all got pushed to like May, right? Right. So there's so many more meetings involved and usually where it's after school or or you get time to do it you get leave you know the district pays half your day so that you can attend a meeting and you have a toc that was not happening here it was not happening and yeah so then you get to june and people are anxious you have reported cases of children getting covid in other parts of the world after returning to school um so all of that blended together uh, really, ma- you know, makes us feel like guinea pigs. And a week in to the reopening, it's a failed experiment. It's one thing if you get data that is really helpful, but like at our school, we had thirty something kids show up this week. That's it, out of like eleven fifty or somewhere around there. Wow. That, that's it. <laughs> like I saw three kids for the week and only one of them was mine like I was trying to help other teachers that so uh, so, you know teachers could stay home if they wanted to Mm -hmm. that was a bit of a my apologies the f word but you know that that was messed up in itself but our our admin was we have a very good admin at our school we've actually been very blessed so it was a little bit easier for for Elliot Matheson but in any case some some teachers did stay home for health reasons Right. So I would take the kids, I would show up, and they'd be like, oh, I didn't know my teacher wasn't here. And I'd be like, just, just come see me, right? And then I would tutor them, and I would ask the teacher what they were doing, and, and then we would be okay. So that right. was it. So, and yes, absolutely, for vulnerable students, that made sense. I'm not saying that um, having the school site being used is not a bad thing. It yeah. actually does help the kids that truly struggle. But so many parents are telling us, we're not sending our kids. We don't care if they're failing. Because really, they're not going to fail anyways. Right. Right? They're just just a sense of the school year is done. And teachers are like, we're not done. (laughs) We're still in. We're still being told, you know, you're working until the last day, you know, by the school act, right? Whatever the rules are by the ministry. You know, that's how it works, right? Yeah. Because I I do know know of a couple of of teachers that... um, they have uh, respiratory conditions, uh, asthma, yeah. th- things like that. So um, I can see where where um, the school district should give them a pass on actually have to show up because that, because they're vulnerable, right? Is yeah. that kind of the case or not so much the case? Can you repeat that last part one more time? Because they have uh, like a respiratory Re- respiratory condition like asthma or yeah. something like that where yeah. they're actually vulnerable to to covid um yeah. so th- so the school district give give did the school district give them a pass on having to show up where they could actually so, do yeah, something from so, online or what yeah it, it, what they decided to do was a a, a process called accommodations mm-hmm. because the question was uh if you do not come to work because of your own illnesses or you live with vulnerable individuals, right? Whatever the case may be. Uh, But you're still an essential worker, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's part of it. 
you know, do you take sick days? And our union was very strong in saying that's not fair. That no teacher should have to use up their sick days uh, to to do something that is keeping the health of the community, right? Right. So what they did is they had everybody apply for something called an accommodation. And what that meant was that you could stay home and work from home. By the way, we've already been doing that, right? That was that was the point. Again, not every jurisdiction was doing this, but we were in BC. Mm -hmm. So we're already online. We're already running our classes. It's not that we never came back to school. The kids are getting some sort of emergency learning, right? Right. So, and it, and it really did not, has not gone well, because even admin have been angry about this. People have been denied those accommodations. Various districts have denied certain people, and, and I think it's many, to be honest, but also the number. So in Surrey alone, um, we have around 6,000 teachers. I think like 10,000 staff, I believe, but 6,000 teachers. And over 1,500 applied for accommodation. So the question became, oh, no, what do we do? If, if, if your buildings are empty, how do you even bring students back in? Um, what's happened is common sense prevailed. And while the district does whatever they want with the paperwork, uh, a lot of admin have just said, that's fine, work from home. Mm -hmm. Right? Just work from home. We know you're working. It's all good. Right. So there is trust that, you know, God forbid, trust your teachers, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that, that was how they dealt with it. So the idea was they, they did want to help folks, but a real concern developed over, well, how long does that last? Um you know, what if the government decides, no, nope, you know, you must be back in the building, right? Like, who knows? But, honestly, the numbers were way too high, and there were folks in Vancouver and, and a lot of a lot of people, teachers, that wanted to almost go on strike, right? Like, they, they wanted to find a way to really, um, you know, stop school from reopening. And they were trying to get, you know, there was a parent petition, that kind of thing, to try to get that going, but... The wheels were already rolling, and your word is, is very important, that they needed to try things out before September. Mm -hmm. They needed to see what would work, what would, didn't work. So I'm not saying that they thought they had the answers. They didn't, and they admitted to that. But in that, it, it is an experiment, right? Like other districts, some teachers are going back two days a week, right? Yeah. Or three days a week. Clearly to me, this is my own opinion, mm -hmm. that... That, clearly that seems to be a bit of a testing ground. Like, let's see what works best, right? Right. Surrey's the biggest. Let's throw them four days a week, right? Mm -hmm. And see what happens there because they'll have the most students. Yeah. But again, it, it's failed because most students are not even coming in. Not that they could have, but we're not even getting to the 20% threshold that the ministry set. Right. So they were saying no more than 20% in the building. I don't know. I haven't done the math. But I would doubt that we've even hit five percent, and I'm sure it's even lower than that. Yeah. Well, um, one of the one of the things that uh, see a lot of a lot of school systems are, uh, when when you look globally actually operate twelve months out of the year. They don't get like a summer break That's and right. and all that kind of stuff. They, there's breaks, but maybe it's more like a spring break sort of thing, right? Yeah. And and, yeah. and spread spread more often throughout the year. Yeah. Um, do you think that that could be a way for for us to go with this so that we can have that 20% threshold where parents will feel comfortable about it, teachers will feel comfortable about it, and um, our health ministry feels comfortable about keeping the schools open, you know, because yeah. we are also our way in what the health ministry thinks is, is also plausible too. Yeah. Because ultimately, they, they're absolutely. the ones that got to take care of us, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, so we had to take a short break because um, it, Annie was, was, was at home and she had to take care of some, some things that needed to be done to, to help uh, empower her life and to help... Um, her family and things like that. So we had to take a short break, and um, Annie uh, called me back, and this is what happened after she called me back. And 
it's funny that it has, I think, more to do with like economics than it does with education. Mm-hmm. Because, well, well, some people will suggest that you know, if kids have, um, like, if you don't have a summer break that's like two months long, that somehow, like, that's uh, that's better for for just like the retention of the material and then just how much they can learn. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I, the jury's kind of out on that, right? Yeah. So there's that piece, which is how educators should be making decisions, right? <laughs> like what actually works best for, you know, the, the, the students learning. But then you get into discussions about, well, what about, um, like the timing of like when companies give their vacations, right? And, you know, what about daycare and all these other like considerations. So I think that has to be kept in mind before they make that decision. Uh, right now, it's interesting that no school district in BC has chosen to elongate their year. Um, I know in Florida, like when we had hurricanes, there was a year where they extended the school year by about like a week or so to make up for the days they had closed. So and now, and now that was prior to like online learning, right? So um, maybe that's that's another thing. But I mean. I, See, all these things are playing in my head. So it could be considered. Um, there are people that really do want to bring that in. I, there'd be a lot of, you'd have to talk a lot with, again, it'd have to be under like an emergency structure because our school act doesn't allow for that. Uh, you'd have, you know, collective agreements would have to be changed, right, in terms of like a long-term solution. Um, right now, we're just dealing under the idea of that we're in an emergency. And, and so for now, you know, in terms of workload, for example, everybody knows that we're, we're asking teachers to do a lot more and that a lot of what we're asking might not quite fit into a collective agreement in terms of the times involved, right, all of that. Right. But we understand that. And so for the time being, we're operating, you know, even though um, there might be questions later on. Mm-hmm. So, sorry, it's a very complicated answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's, I'm sure it's being considered, but I doubt that it's going to be the easiest choice to make. There might be other options that are easier to implement. Yeah, okay. They're, they're, they're looking at blended learning, actually. Sorry, I should mention that. Mm-hmm. A very big thing is they're looking at blended learning, so some kind of, you keep a certain number during the school day, but then the rest of the learning happens online. Okay, so you yeah. report into report into the classroom part time, and then um, and then the other part of the time you you it's a online curriculum. Exactly. So it might okay. be that you have a morning of instruction, mm-hmm. and then the rest of the time is you know again right, or maybe if the facilities are used right, so maybe for PE that might be in the school or or you know whatever extra curriculars like that might still happen, but. Yeah, but, but, but you do, you take some of it offline, and, and some areas do do that. Um, there's a tech aspect, like, and here's one big thing that, that's really come up. I don't, yes, the kids of today are born with, like, technology in their hand, mm-hmm. but it's fascinating to see that I have yet to meet a student that truly loves the model, this online model, right? You might have folks that are dealing with a lot of mental anxiety around school, where that, that works for them. Because now they're at home, they're safe, they can kind of do their own thing. But that's mental issues, right? That that has to do with emotions. Um, but not one student has said, man, I love this. They hate it. You know, they, they can't really do what they want. You know, they, there's no field trips. There's no sense of community. Like, one of the big reasons kids aren't coming to school is because they can't hang out with their friends. We are literally screaming at kids in the hallway to not stand next to each other. That you're coming to class, then you're going home. So there's no socialization, and, and, you know, some kids, you know, I teach in an area where some parents are quite strict around, you know, dating and around hanging out, right? You have to be at home for this, and you have to do this, and I mean every culture. I don't, I'm not singling out any one culture, yeah. um, and so the kids, like, they want to come to school because they want to hang out with their friends, right? Uh, they they want to put on that baseball cap and not allowed to wear it home, right? They, they want to do things that are, are completely okay, but, you know, it's just, like, I grew up in that environment, right? At school, I could do things a little different than I could at home. So, it, it's, the model we have now has not been working, and the online model has not been a success. Like, okay, it's been implemented, 
but for students, their learning has, and, and, and I know it's an emergency, but it has not been what it needs to be. Like, we are... We know September teachers are going to have to do a lot of backfilling. Like there's going to be kids are going to be very well behind, and um, and and uh, you know whatever the standard is. But what I mean is that our kids are feeling like they've missed out, and they have you know that that they're just doing the bare minimum. So that that's a big part of it as well. Okay, so so the kids they 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 they're missing out on the on the social aspects that go along with school. Yeah. And as well as uh, on the educational part, that there there's a, a lag or a fall behind. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Um, one thing to realize is maybe if we didn't have COVID, this works differently. But a lot of our kids are taking care of siblings. Um, even when even when we were really in the midst of things, I, I'm not saying that other countries, like, I mean, you know, deaths are still rising in many areas, but here in BC, you know, we, we, we're, we've now kind of moved through it just a little bit. Uh, but, you know, like, in terms of, like, you have to clean the groceries, you have to clean the house, you have to make sure, you know, your grandparents taken care of, and then the older kids might be working because, they're, you know, when they were hiring at, like, Walmart and, and Superstore, you know, like, all these stores that needed, you know, those those overnight uh, shelves to be stocked, right? All that kind of stuff. So that was, that's getting in the way as well. So it's not a model, like, we'd have to really think about this if we go back to a point where kids are just kids and um, people can go outside and, you know, the, the facilities are open so senior citizens can go to a rec center, right? They're not stuck at home. You're not worried for their health as much. Mm -hmm. Um you know, all of that are things that we've had to kind of consider, and that has absolutely impacted the way we teach. Uh, not every teacher has been doing, you know, those beautiful, you know, you see those, um, those Zoom sessions, right, or team sessions. Beautiful, but a lot of times they're younger. <laughs> the, and, you know, like a lot of the older kids, I, I wanted to do that because all my classes are really based on, like, discourse and dialogue and, and all that kind of stuff, and I found very quickly that almost no kid could make it during the day. And people that did do that, they might get five kids or, you know, like it wasn't, um, yeah. it, it wasn't a real success. So was it worth it? Right. Is it, cause then the other kids are kind of behind on that end as well. Right. Well, yeah, yeah you, you, um, because I've, I've met some of your, your students at, um, at a global peace uh, I event where they all have volunteered and by the yeah. way they had wonderful things to say about um, <laughs> uh, Miss O'Hanna. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a tribute to, to your teaching style. Um, but uh, but they they were older they were all like 16 or older which um they do get hit more with uh, with the household responsibilities if, if, yeah. if they're home, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, and uh, I know that's another thing too, right? Like the opportunities on that end. So I teach in an inner city school, so you know, uh, a big part of what I do is about like some of these kids don't have the same opportunities like others do, right? Um, they can't go just intern at a law firm because their dad works there. Right, mm -hmm. um, like there, there's a lot of, of obstacles for them, and especially if they are visible minorities, and you know all that stuff. So, you know, if I can get the, their foot in a door where they can, you know, contribute to some way and be involved in different things, then then that's great. And and we have, and I mean, I'm still working on it, right? It's not that we, we don't try to provide opportunities. Like I, I told them, like you know, attend webinars, right? You know, like doing that kind of stuff, and and of course, like. Um, you know, the, the food deliveries, but, but again, parents, a lot of them were not comfortable with that. Right. So again, COVID kind of throws a wrench into that. Um, yeah. but, but that's something that I, I very much like, you know, I, I did invite kids to the rallies and trying to get them involved, trying to get them now, you know, when you can have those small meetings, maybe a kid or two can come as well, um, to try to get them back into that service style. But Honestly, we're not going to be able to do that for quite a long time when it comes to like larger events and and you know when they did conferences and and they, they really could uh, engage in some of that like justice work where they're learning new things and they're meeting new people and 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 also what I see very clearly is when they do go for those job interviews when they want to get into teaching or policing or whatever it is they want to do, uh, their resumes help them. 
bottom line, right? Um, they, they have done things that, that show them to be capable of the position they're applying for and, and in a way maybe overcome just a little bit the obstacle of, you know, if they're facing poverty or, or they're facing any kind of oppression, that by providing opportunities through school, and parents have told me this, like they would not know where to start. Right? They would not know where to take their kids. Um, they would not know, you know, or, or they'd feel uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Um, there'd be, you know, like, no doubt. Um, especially for those newer immigrants or refugees, right? Um, it, it is it is harder, not, not because they can't do it, but because society is kind of holding them back a little bit. So it's, and that's a whole other thing, right? A lot of us feel that, like, social justice elements for our students, um, as much as it's all in their face, um, you know, that the realities of how to get them together, you need a space to do that. You need a way to come together and, and have those moments where you can really uh, work together on things so that when they do go out there, you know, they're, they're, they're doing it in the right way and it's not just like charity. Right, right. Um, there, there's, um, of course, charity and then there's... Um, Social service. It's it. They're not. They, one leads into the other, but but um. But when you're doing social service, there, there's uh, there's more opportunity for um, for bigger things to happen, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, there's, there's a way to break barriers, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because it's not <laughs> even we see like the our newer families. Um, they don't have as much access to internet, perhaps, or the language barrier is there. Mm -hmm. So where where you could go to a rally, for example, for Rohingya uh, Muslims, right? And the genocide happening in, in, in Myanmar. And, um, and so you can meet people that a lot of our kids would never meet. And they can hear stories about, you know, how they're trying to fight, you know, to, to, to get that constitution of genocide. How they're trying to, you know, going to the UN, and, but also their daily lives and having to settle a new country and all those things. Like, right now, if I were to tell kids, oh, let's talk about genocide in Myanmar, like, where do we go to online? How do we find those families that, that a lot of them are working, right? Uh, just trying to struggle to get by. So that online model really is deficient in, in, in providing that sense of, uh, of, of communication across those boundaries that, you know, we can't always break ourselves. Mm -hmm. But if, if there's the ability to go out there, um, you know, all it takes is a hello, right? All it takes is... Uh, hearing about a new story, making a sign, and or whatever, finding you know an activist that that might be willing to you know have a meeting, and and, and then you know you can figure out how they can help. That's a big one for me. I I'm, I tell them, you have free education. That's a privilege, right? Yes. So no matter what else you have going on, you do have that privilege. And and if you have the privilege of being in a program where I can source out some funding. I'm talking small, nothing, right? Like a couple hundred bucks. But but even that, then as we've done before, for a group that has no money and, you know, no media is going to come out, but then, you know, I can make a phone call or students can make posters for that group and, and provide them that free of cost and use their bodies, as, you know, to show up and to show support. Like, what a world of difference that makes. And, and that's what we're missing right now, is, is that ability to do that. Even though, mm -hmm. bottom line, I, I got some heat for going to the rallies. And I very simply said, look, people are choosing, are you going to die by COVID? Because we see the data on, on what's happening to, to marginalized people with COVID. Mm -hmm. Or you're, you're going to find yourself in, in a huge mess, in death from, you know, racism. And... Do not tell me that that's, you know, such an easy decision to make. So just like people sacrificed walking across bridges and being killed by police, you know, during the civil rights era, um, you know, any number of things that are going on, indigenous activists shutting down Canada, there is never an easy decision when you protest. And, and protests will always be difficult. It needs to be difficult if it's an actual protest. Yes. And, and, you know, so I went and I told students, like, Please talk to your parents, get that permission. I'm not saying that, you know, you have to do this. But if you can, please do. And we did. We had we had a turnout of some kids, and that was absolutely amazing. But but it was that decision of, yes, masks and trying to social distance, but, you know, uh, you know uh, fuck the rules. Like, it just, um, Dr. Bonnie Henry is amazing, but, but people are really 
living on the edge right now. And, and that solidarity is needed because without it, clearly nothing, nothing changes. Yeah. It, that is a good point with, with, without, uh, solidarity and we all stand standing in unison. Um, that is, that is what, what brings about the the real changes that we need. Right. So, and, and that's what, and what, that's what education is. Yeah. Like, very take, away the building, take away the name of the government. Mm-hmm. If education isn't about building solidarity, finding out about yourself, learning about other people, learning about the world, then then it's not education. If our kids are just filling out boxes and you know doing quote unquote assignments that doesn't actually lead them to connect with the world, then I, I can see some parents that have made that 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 are thinking that way. I'd rather they be out in the world. Uh, than than stuck online in a classroom that right now has no has no meaning to them. Yeah, you bring bring up a, a very good point with that. Anyway, um, we've run out of time, so I um, I want to thank you for for coming on and bring up some really good points about our education system and and it. And reopening our education system here in BC, so the yeah. uh, kids can be back in the classroom. Or it sounds like that's where they want to be anyway. Um, yeah. So. And we will get there. Mm-hmm. And, and I would just my final point would be that we do it with the health and safety of everybody in mind, and that we truly value what teachers have done and what parents have done. Obviously, I don't want to leave anybody out. But mm. teachers have been going over time, you know, just just crazy levels of of, of anxiety and and mental stress to make this possible. And I want to see a government that truly values that. And so whatever plan they come up with, there's an understanding that health and safety and well-being of our educators needs to be at the forefront. Um, and, and we can make it work. But but don't force us back too quick. Don't assume that because our numbers are low, that means people don't have anxiety uh, because this is a global pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. So just just that we have to keep all those things in mind, and but also a reality that um, because technology can really make us believe that we're so great that this has not gone well. Um, we've we've done the bear, we've triaged. A triage is not a cure. Triage does not necessarily save all the lives, right? Um, it, it only deals with the acute crises, and and that's not what we want our education system to be about. Right. Um. I mean, uh, our education system need, needs more than needs more than that. You're absolutely yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Not a problem. My pleasure. Sorry, I know it's been hard to get, to get in touch with me. I'll try to be better. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love we love having you, and um, and if if you ever j- just want to, you have something to say, and and you need to give give a shout out about it. Uh, Please do give us a call back, and we'll have you back on. That would be awesome. You know what? I, yeah, absolutely. That that I will do. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks Thank you, Michael. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay. So we know that government and our school systems and our teachers are really working hard to ensure that. Um, the kids learn and that they keep moving forward with the learning and education and also at the same time they're working really hard to to keep all of us safe and we need to help them keep all of us safe and we need to stick with 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 all the guidelines and and um, at home Teach our kids to, to wash their hands and to maintain some semblance of, of social distancing so that we keep disease down until we can come up with vaccines and cures. Um, so thank you for listening today and we will talk to you again next time. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.